Okay, welcome to the second session of the adult education program. We're going to continue with the Feasts of Christ. Uh, last month we talked about the Annunciation, the announcement of the Archangel Gabriel to the Virgin Mary that she would bear a son through the Holy Spirit and that this son would be the savior of mankind. We talked about Adam and Eve and the fall from paradise and how God had to react to this separation of humanity and divinity. And he did so by becoming a, a man, by becoming a man, and uh, began in the Annunciation, he began the story of salvation. Uh, so we're going to continue to finish the Annunciation, and then we will begin the next feast, which is going to be the Nativity. Uh, this is a quote here from St. Athanasius the Great. St. Athanasius, uh, there's a book written by St. Athanasius called On the Incarnation. So it's very fitting that we refer to him here. His theology was the driving theology of the first ecumenical council, which defeated the great heresy of Arianism. Arius was a priest uh, in, from, I don't want to say it wrong, but he was a priest of the Orthodox Church, of the Christian Church, who was teaching that Christ was not divine, that he was a creature. And St. Athanasius' theology was the theology that drove the first ecumenical council, which denounced Arius, and uh, so he's very, uh, in terms of uh, his theology, especially on this topic, uh, very pertinent. So here's what St. Athanasius says. You know what happens when a portrait that has been painted on a panel becomes obliterated through external stains. So imagine a painting on a panel that has been uh, worn down, that has stains on it. So the, the art, he says the artist does not throw away the panel. But the subject of the portrait has to come and sit for it again. And then the likeness is redrawn on the same material. So the thing I, I always think about, and we may have referred to this last time, is Pablo Picasso. If you ever see some of his work, you'll see, for example, the blue guitarist, which we have here at, in the Art Institute of Chicago. You'll see that it's painted on top of a previous painting. He didn't th want to throw away his material because, well, first of all, it costs money to replace it. And uh, he wanted to use it and, and make it into what it was meant to be. And so even artists, real artists or, or uh, worldly artists, do the same thing. So St. Athanasius is saying, basically, when humanity, which is God's painting of himself, we were made in the image of God, when his painting of humanity became uh, distorted and became disfigured through sin, he didn't want to throw out what he had done already. He wanted to repaint it. He wanted to remake the image. And so, St. Athanasius continues, Even so was it with the all-holy Son of God. He, the image of the Father, came and dwelt in our midst, in order that he might renew mankind made after himself and seek out his lost sheep. So, who was it that sat for the portrait, so to speak? It was Christ himself. He didn't... Um, he didn't make new people like creating Adam and Eve. He didn't start from the beginning by making Adam and Eve over again. He himself became a man so that humanity could be perfected in his image and likeness. So in the Annunciation, God and humanity are reconnected in the person of Jesus Christ. And I have a... a so we talked about how the Annunciation shows us how much God loves us. And I have two great quotes here from St. Nikolai Velimirovic, who was a Serbian theologian and saint and hierarch uh, 
who didn't live too long ago, and he has many, many sermons, beautiful sermons. And he says, The coming of God among men is the most gentle expression of his love for men. Like a flaming pillar in the deepest darkness, so is the coming of God among men. And he continues here, The coming of the Lord Christ into the world reveals the limitless love of God for man. If man has brought about a distancing between himself and God, it is God, nevertheless, who makes the first approach to man to bridge this division. So Christ in the Annunciation is trying to bridge the division between humanity and divinity, which man, as we talked about last month, cannot overcome on its own. We ourselves cannot overcome that division on our, uh, through our own power because we're fighting death as our enemy. And we as people cannot overcome death on our own. So we talked about Christ as the new Adam. How Adam had to be, Christ had to come and take Adam's place because he failed his mission, so to speak. Well, if Christ is the new Adam, then the Virgin Mary, the Panagia, is the new Eve. And we see a very distinct contrast between the two characters of Eve and the Virgin Mary. Of course, Eve in the Genesis story falls into the temptation of the serpent and, uh, and, and breaks the commandment of God. E, uh, the Virgin Mary, on the other hand, God approaches her through the archangel Gabriel and delivers the message of the good news. And what does Mary say? Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. So if Adam and Eve's job was to be obedient to God's one commandment and live with him in paradise, and they failed that job, it is Christ and the Virgin Mary who kind of retake that uh, mantle, so to speak. And you hear the, the Virgin Mary's words, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. So she is, has complete obedience to God. And you see in this icon of the Virgin Mary, her head is bowed to the angel and to God's will as she's being blessed by the Holy Spirit. So you see again her obedience um, to the will of God. So I have another couple of quotes here. So Eve first fell into sin, and this in the brightness of paradise, where everything protected her from sin. So in other words, the first people had everything going for them, and yet they still fell. Mary was the first to overcome all temptations, and this in the darkness of the world, where everything pulls towards sin. The Virgin Mary, in contrast, is living in the world, the fallen world, where everything, as St. Nicholas says, is going towards sin, and she somehow, through her love of God and God's love for her, uh, is able to overcome all of those temptations. And then here's a quote from Metropolitan Hierotheos of Nafpaktos, who I will reference often. He's a theologian, modern-day theologian in Greece. He says, There it was from a woman that the fall and its consequences began. And here it was from a woman that all the good things began. Thus the Panagia is the new Eve. The sensory paradise was there, here the church. So he's saying Panagia instead of Eve. The church instead of Eden. There Adam, Christ. So Christ instead of Adam. Here, there Eve, here Mary. There the snake, here Gabriel. So now instead of the, the, the message being brought by evil, it's being brought by God. There the whispering of the serpent snake to Eve, here the angel's salutation to Mary. So the story is kind of being rewritten here. How the mankind's fall is now being transformed into mankind's salvation. In this way, the error of Adam and Eve was corrected. Any questions so far? Okay, so the Annunciation of Christ, it starts a new era. It's a new reality for all of humankind. Because it is the, the new reality is that God has become a man and is one of us. So back to kind of that quote from, Saint, uh, from um, Bishop Hierotheos. He says the new kingdom is the church. So if God has come as a man to establish a new kingdom, to rewrite the story of man's fall into salvation, he does that by establishing the church. So what is it that Christ offers us in becoming man? Union with God and the ability to live forever with him in paradise. And the only way that we can find our way as Orthodox Christians to that new reality, to that gift that God is offering, is through the church. Here's another quote from Metropolitan Eurotheos. The Annunciation to the Theotokos is an Annunciation to the human race. Information that the Son and Word of God has become incarnate. So this message is a message for all people everywhere. This universal feast should contribute to our personal feast, 
our personal annunciation. We must accept the preface of our salvation, which is the greatest piece of news in our life. So not only is this, I like to compare it to like a, a museum exhibits, right? The feasts are not museum exhibits. They're not something that happened thousands of years ago, hundreds of years ago, that we keep them over there in their spot in the museum exhibit room 1A. There's something that's supposed to be personal to us, something that is supposed to be experienced and lived every day in our Christian life. And this is why, again, the life of the church becomes so important, because it is in the church that we experience these things firsthand, and they become part of who we are. So the Annunciation, the news that God has become man, is the greatest piece of news in our life, and I would say the greatest piece of news in all of human history. In the life of every Christian, there will be divine annunciations, moments when God lets us know His will and His intention concerning us. But all these annunciations must unite to become the one essential annunciation, the annunciation that Jesus can be born in us, can be born through us, not in the same way that he was conceived and brought into the world by the Virgin Mary, for that is a unique miracle that cannot be equaled, but in the sense that the Savior takes spiritual and at the same time very real possession of our being. St. Paul says, it is not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And so the Annunciation, the Incarnation of the Lord, is meant to take place in our hearts, that we can be, just as the divine was united to the human in Christ, that we also can be united to God in Christ in our hearts and in our souls. Okay, that feeds perfectly into the next feast, which is the Nativity of the Lord, which is now the revelation of Christ in the world. Of course, we all know Christmas celebrated December 25th, calling up, coming up uh, very shortly. It'll be here before we know it, so it's a good that we're uh, studying it this month. Here's a quote from St. Gregory Palamas, 14th century saint from Thessaloniki and uh, one of the great fathers of our church. He says, for nothing done by God from the beginning of time was more beneficial to all or more divine than Christ's nativity, which we celebrate today. So he's talking about in the story of salvation, up to this point, the nativity is the greatest thing that has happened. Because in the incarnation, in the annunciation, it's kind of like, a, almost like a behind the, behind the scenes deal, right, between man and God. It's not something that's done openly or in public. It's something done in a very private way between the Archangel Gabriel and the Virgin Mary. Now in the Nativity, the truth of what's taking place is starting to be revealed. God is starting to show it to the world. Not in a full way. We'll see that more with the Feast of Epiphany, uh, Theophania, which is January 6th. But this is kind of the start of the revelation, Christ's birth. So up to this point in the life of Christ, it's the greatest thing that God has done. Okay, so the story of salvation continues. The Incarnation is revealed. So as I was just mentioning, you know, the Annunciation is a private event, but now the story is getting out. For example, we have the angels announcing to the shepherds and the magi following the star, and they all come to Bethlehem, to the cave, to witness the birth of Christ. And not only witness that He is born, but who He is that He is the awaited Messiah, that He is the King that everyone is waiting to come. The revelation is not complete because many are still unaware of His coming, um, but God chooses some here to know the mystery taking place. And it's interesting to th think who it was that He chose to meet Christ at His birth, right? The shepherds. They're nobodies in society. They're just poor, uneducated people wandering the fields with their sheep but it's because of their humility that God shows them the reality of the Incarnation. The Magi, who were not even Jews, they were Gentiles, or pagans, are faithful to the star. So God sends the star to lead them. And what do they do? They follow it. So those who are willing to follow God uh, in a complete way get to meet Him and get to know Him. So kind of an interesting point there. The birth of Christ. That's what we're talking about here. So I have an icon here of the Virgin Mary with Christ uh, in, the, in the cave. You see the animals in the back. Uh, so it was a manger. A manger was like a stable, but it was basically a cave where animals were kept. So that's where Christ was born. Uh, we'll refer to this, the nativity icon, a few more times, so keep it in mind. So when we say Christ, we have to understand what that means. It's not just the birth of Jesus to emphasize His humanity, so to speak. It's the birth of Christ. 
Christ in Greek means the anointed one, the one chosen by God. And in this case, the Christ is the God-man. He is God and man in one person. Two natures in one person, without confusion, division, or change. Now, what do we mean by that? This is one of the declarations of the ecumenical councils. And that means that God's divinity was in no way confused, divided, or changed by Him becoming, taking on human flesh. And the humanity of Christ was not changed, confused, or divided from our own humanity. They remain, He's a perfect God and perfect man. 100% God, 100% man in one person. And this is from one of the hymns from Christmas, the Vespers hymns, which we'll do here at Panayias the night before Christmas, on Christmas Eve. Come, let us greatly rejoice in the Lord as we tell of this present mystery. For the express image of the Father, the imprint of His eternity, meaning the Son, meaning Christ, takes the form of a servant. So the Son of God, the Son and Word of God, the second person of the Trinity, takes the form of a servant. And without undergoing change, He comes forth from a mother who knew not wedlock. For what He was, He has remained true God. He in no way loses any of his godhood. And what he was not, he has taken upon himself, becoming man through love for mankind. So this is the new reality of Jesus Christ. God and man in one person. And we'll see what that, we've already talked a little bit about what that means, and we'll see as the story continues, as we go through all these months, what the effect of that is on, on humanity. These are two quotes here from uh, Matthew 1 to kind of show us the same thing. Um, so here we have the, uh, this is the angel visiting Joseph. Remember Joseph, he finds out that the Virgin Mary is pregnant and he's getting ready to throw her out of his house because it would have been a uh, scandal to have her staying at the, his house with him. So the angel comes and says, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So the Holy Spirit conceives in the Virgin Mary the child, so the child is of God, and the child is God. And then we have here also from Matthew chapter 1, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. And this is from the prophecy of Isaiah, who was the first one to foresee the virgin birth of Christ. So Christ is God and man in one person. What does this mean for us? Let's start getting into it. If Christ is both God and man, if God has taken on humanity in the person of Jesus Christ, then God and man are reunited. And as we hear in the words of St. Paul, Brethren, when the time had fully come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. So the consequence of the Son and Word of God becoming a person is that we now have been adopted by God as His children. We are children of God. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then also an heir of God through Christ. Through the fall, humanity was enslaved, enslaved by sin and by death. But in our being adopted by God as His children, we now become heirs of God, heirs of His heavenly kingdom, which is the inheritance that He leaves for us. This is St. Paul from Galatians. And this is a quote from St. John of Kronstadt. And so, my brothers, the feast of the Nativity of Christ reminds us that we are born of God, that we are sons of God, that we have been saved from sin, and that we must live for God and not sin, not for flesh and blood, not for the world which lies in evil. So this marks a change of a, the way of life that God is calling us to. Not that God was calling us to sin first, but that we had been oppressed by sin and by death. And now God has given us, because we are sons of God now, we have been given a way out of that life leading to nothing. And now our life leads to the kingdom of heaven. Any questions? No? We'll continue. God reveals His love for us through His humility. One of the amazing things about the feasts, and especially Nativity, and we'll see later on in crucifixion, things like that, um, crucifixion and resurrection, 
is that God is extremely humble. Even though he doesn't have to be, right? He doesn't have to be humble. He's beyond any power that we know. He's beyond everything that we know. And yet he, show, he approaches us as his creation in the most extreme, extremely humble ways. So God shows his humility in becoming a man. And this hum humility is a revelation of his love for us. We talked about in the Annunciation is a show of how much he loves us. In the same way, the Nativity is a continuation of that love and that humility. Think about God, the, you know, the nature of God. He's so beyond anything that we can think of that we can't even comprehend what that means, the nature of God. You know, we can't, he's so transcendent above us. And what was his decision? His decision was to become one of us. It's like imagine if, if one of us made like a birdhouse, right? Or, or something very like trivial, something you know, that could be destroyed in one second. If it made like a paper airplane, right? Would any of us ever decide to become the paper airplane for its salvation? How, what humility on God's part that required of him and that he shows for us. And that's what we are. I mean, that's how we relate to God. If, if God is... If we compare our, you know, if God is to humans as humans are to paper airplanes. Like, that's how, that's how utterly transcendent he is of, of, of us. So, in a way, he empties himself and becomes a man for our sake. He takes on everything, every struggle that we face in this life, he takes it on. And he empties himself and becomes a human being. So this is Metropolitan Neorotheos, who we quoted for Annunciation as well. By his creation, God gave us what is highest. That is to say, to be in the image and likeness of God. But we did not protect it. We lost it. Now he's going back, Yerotheos, Metropolitan Yerotheos is going back to the beginning again. He's talking about Adam and Eve. He created humans in his image and likeness, but we lost that, that likeness with God through our sins. Now the word of God, the prototype of our creation, came and assumed the lowest. That is to say, our own nature. In order to free us from decay, and in order to renew the vessel which had become useless and broken. So God leaves, kind of a, he kind of puts down for a, you know, a minute. Not that, he, not that his divinity was separated from him in, in Christ, but he condescends to us and he becomes a man for our sake so that we can be renewed and recreated. And I like what he says, he compares us to the vessel which had become useless and broken. That was humanity before the coming of Christ, useless and broken as well as to rid us of the tyranny of the devil and instruct us in the new life. St. Gregory the theologian here, who's one of the, th uh, the three uh, hierarchs. He that is full empties himself, for he empties himself of his glory for a short while, that I may have a share in his fullness. Notice the change there of the subject. He's talking about Christ. God empties himself for a short time that I may have a share in his fullness. He does it for our sake so that we can take even on to become like God. And it's the St. Paul again. So he's talking about Christ, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. So Christ, St. Paul is saying, is equal with God. But he made himself of no reputation, taking the form, form of a servant and coming in the likeness of men. So even though he's equal with God, he becomes also one of us. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. When I was preparing my presentation, I thought of the TV show, um, oh my gosh, Undercover Boss. Have you guys ever seen that show where a boss of a large corporation takes on like the hourly worker jobs and he like goes to the bottom levels and kind of sees how his company's working? Well, kind of in the same way, God, who's kind of like, you know, the boss of everything, he becomes like the lowest of the low. And not only that, but he does it. It's almost like if the undercover boss was then like fired by somebody in his company, right? God becomes one of us and we, what do we do to him? We kill him. We kill him on the cross. But he does it knowing that by his suffering, he can overcome all of our suffering. And so that we can be raised to a new height and to a new uh, reality which is the kingdom of God and unity with him. This is from the Orthros of Nativity, the Matins, the morning service before the liturgy. They were amazed to see neither scepter. This is talking about the wise men. They were amazed to see neither scepter nor throne, but only utter poverty. So the Magi come to the cave, and they don't find him as a king. They find utter poverty. What is meaner than a cave? 
What is humbler than swaddling clothes? Yet therein shone forth the wealth of your divinity. Glory to you, O Lord. So when, in Christ's birth, he's born in the most humble fashion. You know, not only does he become a man, he does so in the humblest of ways. He's not born as a king in Jerusalem, which is the royal city. He doesn't, he's not born with fine, you know, comfortable beds and nice clothes and sumptuous foods like we were hearing in the gospel today of the rich man and Lazarus. He's not born with any of that. He's not even born in a house. He's born in a cave with animals, which is a stable for animals, dirty, because that's all that humanity could offer him. And he enters right into it. He doesn't have any problem entering right into it for our own salvation. And so this is the God that we worship and love. He is the God of extreme humility, which is foreshadowing of the future humility that he will show at his crucifixion and resurrection, which is what we have here. We have two icons. The one on the left is the Virgin Mary with Christ. I showed this one earlier as well. And you can see a couple of things. The cave is very dark, right? The cave is very dark, which is symbolic of darkness, sin, and death. So this is what Christ is born into. You also see the crib that he's sitting in. It doesn't really look like a crib that you would normally have for a baby. It kind of looks like what you see on the right. You see where on the right you have the crucified Christ who has now died on the cross. He's now been taken down from the cross. And what is that box that he's in? It's the tomb. It's the, it's his, it's the tomb where he is laid to rest as a, as a dead person. So even in the nativity and in the expression of our theology and our iconography and in our, our hymns, the nativity already is foreshadowing Christ's death. It's saying almost, if, you, if God is showing how humble he is in being born in a cave in Bethlehem, just wait until you see how truly, how humble he is when he really reveals his humility in his death. We won't get too far into that because that's a little bit ahead in the story, but a little foreshadowing. Keep it in your minds. Another theme that's important here is uh, in the nativity is light in the darkness and the word became flesh. This is from, uh, that's from John chapter 1. So light in the darkness. So in the nativity story, of course, Christ is revealed to the shepherds uh, by angels who appear to them at night. And then you also have the magi, right? You have the magi who see the star from far away. It can, it's brighter than all the stars in the, in the heavens. And it calls them to Bethlehem to come and worship him. So in a very physical way, you have two examples of light shining in the darkness as Christ is entering into the world. The hymn of Christmas uh, is, kind of expands on this theme as well. It says, Your nativity, O Christ our God, has shone upon the world with the light of knowledge. For thereby they who adored the stars through a star were taught to worship you, the Son of Righteousness, and to know you, the day spring from on high. So, Christ has come now into the world of darkness and sin and death, and now he's going to shine light into it. Uh, St. Porfirios, who is a very beautiful modern-day saint from Greece who died in the 90s, he taught that when a person is really struggling, when a person is overcome by temptation and sin, it's like their heart is full of darkness. And when they, if they try, however, to fight the darkness, they try to fight the passions and the temptations in the darkness, they will never succeed because we're not strong enough to overcome the darkness. The best way, he says, is to open the window so that the light can come in because the light is God. And the light will disperse the darkness instantly. And in the same way that we are called to open our hearts to Christ so that our temptations and sin can be overcome, Christ now enters the world in its darkness so that he can scatter the darkness with his own light of his divinity. So this is a new way of life. Christ is calling us to a new way of life. This is John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that had been made, has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So from the coming of Christ into the world, he has given us his light to overcome the darkness, which is sin and death. 
Metropolitan Yero. How are we doing on time, by the way? I don't have a watch on me today. Hmm? Okay, still got a few minutes. Good. Metropolitan Yerotheos here, he quotes St. Simeon the New Theologian. So he says, St. Simeon the New Theologian says that when a man purifies his heart and is illuminated, then he receives Christ within himself and he understands his infant like leaps. So he not only does he have Christ inside of him, but he can sense Christ moving and acting inside of him. Christ is conceived as an infant in him and is born through the virtues. And now the man is living all these events in his being. So we talked during the Annunciation, at the end of our slides in the Annunciation, about how we're called to experience these things personally, to live them out in our own lives. And now St. Simeon, uh, Metropolitan Erotheos, through the teachings of St. Simeon, is showing us, kind of revealing to us how that happens, how that takes place, how we can experience these feast days in our own lives, even though they happened so long ago. He says... A man must have his heart purified and illuminated through his own work and through God, both. There has to be a synergy between God and man. So when a man purifies his heart and is illuminated, then he receives Christ within himself, the same way the Virgin Mary received Christ in herself and bore him and then gave birth to him. So we can receive Christ in our own hearts when we are purified and illuminated by God, when we let the light shine into our lives. We have Christ within ourselves. And then we can feel him acting in our, in our lives. So Christ then is conceived as a child in us. Now think about that. You know, God gives us the opportunity to carry him in our hearts, to have him with us constantly, to have him be born in us and to us to be reborn through him in that, in that same kind of way. Oh, same slide. Okay. So we have a call to a new way of life. We have a call to have Christ born in our hearts and to become Christ bearers. So not only are we to have Christ in our hearts, it's not a momentary thing, right? It's, not, it's the same way that the Virgin Mary was pregnant with Christ. She carried him for nine months and then she was with him for his entire life. Same thing with us. When Christ is conceived in our hearts, we're called to bear him, to carry him with us into the world and into our lives. And to always have him and to take care of that gift that God has given us. And we're called also to accept the light of Christ into our hearts to transform and illuminate us. Any questions for this session on the Nativity or any of the th things that we've talked about so far? So we see now a progression. Well, I'll get to you, Kirsten. So we see a progression. First we see God becoming, being conceived in the Virgin Mary. Now he is born. The revelation is being made. And as we move forward to the Epiphany, well, we'll first we'll talk about um, the meeting of the Lord in the temple. And then we'll talk about Epiphany when his public ministry begins. The revelation is now made public for all mankind. And uh, so we're seeing now the progression and what this means for humankind in the story of salvation. Yes, Chris, you have a question? I, did, I have a question. Is, uh, sometimes um, Christ uh, asks a question. Like I, I think it was last week, you know, he asked, who was that, who was that that touched the hem of my mm -hmm. garment? Right. And, but he's... God, I mean, right. he, he would know. He would know that. Yeah. So, how does that? So, without having any patristic commentary in front of me, um, there's a couple of ways you can look at it. Uh, the way that I kind of think about it is that usually when God does stuff like that, um, when Christ has a situation in front of himself where he kind of knows what's going on, but he like asks a question anyway, uh, he does it. Because he wants, to, he wants the person to act on their own freedom. He doesn't call out the woman, right? He doesn't say, hey, you, you touched me. He doesn't call her out in front of the crowd. He gives her the opportunity. He says publicly, he says, who touched me? I, someone touched me. I know someone touched me. He gives her the opportunity to approach him on her own will. And this is what God does in our lives. He doesn't force his way. He doesn't beat down the doors into our hearts. The only thing he's ever beaten down is the gates of Hades so that he can release, so that he could free humankind from death. Our own hearts, though, it says in Revelation, I stand at the door and I knock, right? He's knocking. So he's calling the woman, right? Who is it that touched me? In the Old Testament, I was just reminded, in the Old Testament, God, whenever he calls the prophets, he does so in the form of a question. So Isaiah, for example, he sees a vision of God in the temple. It's Isaiah and God in the temple, right? And God's glory is filling the temple, and it's everywhere. It can't, it's undeniable. There's angels flying around. And God asks a question. He says, 
who is it that will go into the world and preach my, preach my message to the people? It's him, and Isaiah, it's him and Isaiah. There's no one else. And God says, who is it that will come and be my messenger? And Isaiah says, here I am, Lord. So in the same way, God, talking to this woman, he's not trying to call her out. You know? He wants her to come on, his own, on her own free will and say, here I am. This is me. You know? And she confesses to him that, yeah, I'm the one that touched you. This is why. She does so kind of in an embarrassed way. But Christ raises her up and says, woman, your faith has made you well. And so, in the same way, like I said, God's not going to force us into our hearts. He's not going to force us into our lives. We're called, right? Even in the Christmas story, this, this is a, a sneak peek into my newsletter article this month. Even in the Christmas story, right? Christ is born as a man. God's glory, you know, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill to all people. The new reality of the kingdom brought to earth by the God-man Christ, right? So you have this great reaction, the shepherds, angels, magi, all the things we celebrate every year, make Christmas ornaments and cookies out of them, all that good stuff. And then you have on the, literally at the same exact time, you have who? Herod, who kills 14,000 babies trying to kill Christ. So Christ doesn't force his way into the world and show himself in a way where people don't have a choice to accept or deny him. It's up to us in our hearts to say yes or to say no. And so we see that from the very beginning. We see from the very beginning. We see Christ's the Christ bearers, so to speak, and the Christ opponents from the very beginning. So that's kind of how I would answer that question. There's other times when, like, Christ with the disciples, you know, he, uh, he, he knows things and he's asking them questions, you know, as if, you know, it's like, what do people say that I am? You know, who am I? What do you say that I am? You know, and he gets, he gets the response that he's looking for through the faith of Peter. So there's other examples of that as well. So that's, that's how I would answer your question. I hope that uh, covers it. Any other questions? By any, I mean, we talk about anything. We have a, uh, maybe a minute or two left, probably. Any other ideas, thoughts, questions, concerns? Yes, Alex. Um, obviously, God is all powerful, so He can do anything He wants. So, right. So, in what do you think these these um, events occurred? I mean, it was strictly because for the benefit of man to under, try to understand Him in his own way, even such... Saying, why did these events occur the way that they did? Yeah. Well, I think it's kind of for all the reasons we've been talking about. You know, God, first of all, uh, you know, all these things happened at the, at, the, at the right time, so to speak. Everything at that point in human history is kind of pointing to the coming of Christ. You know, in Jewish history, they're awaiting the Messiah. You have the Roman Empire. I mean, now we're talking history-wise. You have the Roman Empire, which is the perfect landscape for the coming of Christianity. You have a giant area with, that all speaks the same language, Greek, and that has great roads and infrastructure so that the apostles and the messengers of the gospel can travel wherever they want as quickly as possible. So even in that, it's like the coming of Christ is done at that time. You know, there's, there's reasons why. Um, but also in a way where, like I said, God is humble. He doesn't reveal himself in a way where it's like, bam, oh, you know it's God, you know what I mean? Christ doesn't reveal himself in a way where you know he's God. He always gives you the opportunity to accept or deny him. Because like, like I was saying to Chris's question, it's, it's not a matter of him uh, forcing his way into the hearts of man, but for man to give our hearts to God. Um, because otherwise we would just be his slaves at that point. And like we talked about today, God doesn't want slaves. He wants children. He wants us to be his children, not his slaves. Um, so he gives us the choice to say yes or no. All right, if there are no further questions, we'll conclude for this month, and then we will gather next month as we move forward in the feast. So may God bless all of you. Ta